legislation. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. I know Colchester in Oswald. Question one, please. Mr Speaker, I know that the thoughts of the whole House are with the people of Hainault in East London. Following yesterday's appalling attack, such violence has no place on our streets. It's absolutely heartbreaking that a teenage boy has died, and I can't imagine what his family are going through. And We send them our heartfelt condolences and offer our very best wishes to all those injured. And I'd just like to reiterate my thanks to the police and other emergency first responders for embodying the highest standards of public service under such awful circumstances. And I know that our thoughts are also with those injured this morning in an attack at a school in Sheffield. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We already know that more than one in five teenagers are vaping, with some experts describing this as an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, new research suggested that teenagers who vape could be at risk of exposure to toxic metals, potentially harming brain or organ development. I agree with the Prime Minister in his wish to reduce the harms caused by smoking and vaping with the Tobacco and Vapes Bill. Will he agree with me that permitting football strips to be sponsored by vaping companies sends entirely the wrong message to young people yes. and that it's now time to ban vape companies advertising on sports strips? Yes. Yes. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank uh, the, the Honourable Lady for her question? Obviously, your decisions about kit sponsorship will rest with individual teams, but I do, but I do, but I do, but I do agree with her that it is important we do everything we can to tackle the scourge of teenage vaping, which is why I'm glad that she supports our bill, which will clamp down on the marketing, availability of flavours, targeting point-of-sale purchases, uh, but also improving funding for trading standards to clamp down on those selling vapes illegally to children. Dr Lisa Cameron. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My husband is a veteran, and the defence of the country is the government's first duty to protect people across the United Kingdom. Yeah, so, yeah. can the Prime Minister reassure the House that he has a plan in place to back our world leading armed services? And does he know why the party opposite refused to back his plan? Yeah. Well, I, can I start by paying tribute to my honourable friend's husband and all our veterans for their service to our country. And she's right, in the most uncertain time since the Cold War, that it's right that we build our security, protecting our values, our interests and indeed our nation. That's why this government has taken the step to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP, making us the biggest spender in Europe under NATO. And when the later Labour leader stands up, I hope that he stops dithering, does the right thing, and confirms that he will back our plan to increase defence spending. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I join with the Prime Minister in his words about yesterday's awful events at Hainault. I'm sure the whole House will want to commend the first responders and send our deepest condolences to the family of the 14-year-old boy who was murdered. Yeah. And I join with the Prime Minister's remarks about the attack in the school in Sheffield as well. I know everyone in this House will be delighted to see His Majesty the King returning to his public duties yeah. and looking so well, and we all wish him and the Princess of Wales the best in their continued recovery. Yeah. I'd also like to welcome the member for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich yeah. to his place on these benches. After nearly two decades as a Tory politician and an NHS doctor, <coughs> Mr Speaker, he's concluded that if you care about the future of our country and our NHS, then it's time for change. It's time for this changed Labour Party. Uh, and as of today, as of today, he's our newest Labour MP. But I'm sure he won't mind me saying that I hope he loses that title on Friday. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when a lifelong Tory and doctor says that the only cure for the NHS is a Labour government, isn't it the time the Prime Minister admits 
He has utterly failed. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, I'm glad to actually see the honourable gentleman from Central Suffolk. <laughs> That's because, but that's because, that's because he recently pointed out that residents of his local Labour council are, and I quote in his words, charged much more in council tax, but in return receive lower quality services. Now, he's, he's been wrong about some things recently, but on that point, he's absolutely right. And this week, people everywhere should vote Conservative. He, he comes out with all that nonsense, but it, he locks himself away in Downing Street bunker, moaning that people aren't grateful enough to him. The reality is Tory MPs are following Tory voters in concluding that only the Labour Party can deliver the change that the country needs. And I say to those Tory voters, if they believe in a better Britain, then they're safe with this changed Labour Party, and it's for them. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, in the two weeks since we last met at this dispatch box, has the Prime Minister managed to find the money for his completely unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Mr. Mr Speaker, of course, we addressed that a few weeks ago, and I'm happy to address it again. But I know, look, I know that economics is not his strong point, but... But he might do well. He might do well, actually, to listen to a shadow education secretary who, who just this morning said, "No, that's not how it works, Mr. Speaker." Indeed, the IFS have also said the link between national insurance and public services funding is illusory, just like Labour's economic plans, Mr. Speaker. But it's crystal clear that there's one party that's going to deliver tax cuts for working Britain, and it's the Conservative Party. That was a long ramble. Oh, 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 whoever's banging the furniture will have to pay for your damages. Can we have less of it? <laughs> we are not at the sixth form, no. Come on. Well, that was a long rambling non-answer to the question, which was, has he found the money to fund his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance? And whenever he's asked about the date of the election or people's pensions, he acts as if answering straightforward questions is somehow beneath him. But pensioners... And those who are planning their retirement deserve better than his contempt for their questions. Because if £46 billion were cut from its funding, the value of the state pension would almost half. So I don't apologise for asking him again. Mr Gullis, you've got the next question you're not going to reach. You've got a ten-minute rule bill. I'd be quiet for a while if I were you. Prime Minister. Sorry, Leader of the Opposition. So I don't apologise for asking on their behalf again whether he will finally rule out cutting their state pension to fulfil the enormous black hole in his spending plans. Uh, Mr Speaker, of course we can rule that out, and the honourable gentleman should stop scaremongering because it's thanks... It's thanks to the triple lock that we've increased pensions by £3,700 since 2010, and they will rise in each and every year of the next Parliament. But it's Labour that always hits pensioners hard. It's his mentors, Blair and Brown, that broke their promises, raised pension taxes by £118 billion, and delivered an insulting 75p rise in the state pension. As one former Labour adviser just said, Brown destroyed our pension system. They did it before, they'll do it again. Labour always betray our pensioners. Mr Speaker, it's clear he can't answer the question where he's going to find this £46 billion. No, he said, luckily for him, no, that's where he said it's not coming from. It's not saying where it's coming from. Luckily for him, one of his peers, Lord Frost, yes, him again, does. He says to solve the tourist spending plans, the state pension age should be raised to 75. Now, understandably, that will cause some alarm. So will the Prime Minister rule out forcing people to delay their retirement by years and years in order to fulfil his £46 billion black hole? 
Mr. Speaker, I've answered this multiple times to the Honourable General. I'm happy to say again, this is the party that has delivered and protected the triple lock. But I know, Mr. Speaker, ultimately, he's not worried about any of this because we all remember that he's got his very own personal pension plan. I think we, we all remember it, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, it comes with its very own special law. It was called the Pension Increase Scheme for Keir Starmer QC. It's literally one law for him and another one for everyone else. He wants to abolish national insurance. It will cost £46 billion, and he won't tell us where the money is coming from. We're no closer to an answer. I'm going to persevere, because last year the Prime Minister was apparently drawing up plans to remove the winter fuel allowance from pensioners. His paymaster general went a step further. He said these are the sorts of things that we need to look at. So will he now rule out taking pensioners' winter fuel payments off them to help fund his £46 billion black hole? Mr Speaker, it it was this government that just this winter provided double the winter fuel payment to support pensioners. But what is crystal clear, Mr Speaker, is that we believe that the double taxation on work is unfair, Mr Speaker. We believe that hard work should be rewarded, and that's why this week we're cutting taxes by £900 for everyone in work. But in contrast, Mr Speaker, it's Labour's newest tax adviser who thinks pensioners should be taxed more. That's his words, Mr Speaker. This adviser calls them codgers. He thinks that supporting them is a disgrace, and he believes that their free TV licences are ridiculous, Mr Speaker. It's Labour who hit pensioners with tax after tax, and they would do it all over again. Mr Speaker, is it any wonder that his MPs are following Tory voters in queuing up to dump his party? And even, even the mayors that he's apparently pinning his political survival on don't want to be seen anywhere near him. Because until he starts selling out how he's paying for his fantasy economics, he's got a completely unfunded £46 billion promise that puts people's retirement at risk. How does it feel to be one day out from elections with the message, vote Tory, risk your pension? Mr Speaker, tomorrow voters will have a choice, and it will be a choice it will be a choice between mayors like Andy Street and Ben Houchen who are delivering, or mayors like Sadiq Khan who, who just simply virtue signal, Mr Speaker. It's higher taxes, more crime and you less with Labour, or it's lower taxes and better services with the Conservatives. That's the choice. From West Midlands to Teesside to London, there is only one choice. Vote Conservative. Mr Speaker, we can see the Rwanda deterrent is working and we've now deported our first illegal migrants. But unsurprisingly, Labour just don't care. The Shadow Home Secretary is busy posing for pics, encouraging more boats to come over. The leader of the Labour Party said he would cancel the Rwanda flights. He took a knee when signing letters stopping us deporting illegal foreign national offenders who committed crimes like murder and rape. And he'd do a deal with the EU surrendering our borders to 100,000 legal migrants. Isn't it right, Prime Minister, that only the Conservatives will stop the boats and cut legal migration? Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right, Mr Speaker. Our plan is working. Legal migration, the latest figures show, down by 24 per cent. Student dependence down by 80 per cent. But we all know Labour's big idea. It's to scrap the Rwanda plan, even when it's operational, Mr Speaker. But as one senior Labour adviser said to Andrew Marr just yesterday, we can't just come in, tear it up and have nothing to put in its place. I'm sorry to break it to them, but that's exactly their policy. While we're getting on stopping the boats, all Labour would do is stop the planes. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. On Monday, the Armed Forces Minister was neither able to confirm nor deny that UK troops may soon be deployed on the ground in the Middle East. Now, the public watching will be hoping that members of this House do not have a short memory when it comes to the potential deployment and involvement of our military in the Middle East. So can I ask the Prime Minister to provide some much-needed clarity? 
Is he giving active consideration to the deployment of UK forces in the Middle East, yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, you wouldn't expect me to get into any operational planning details, but what I will say, what I will say is we are absolutely committed to, to supporting international efforts to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza, which is something I think the whole House would support by land, sea and air. We have obviously tripled our aid commitment, and right now, together with the US, Cyprus and other partners, we are setting up a new temporary pier off the coast of Gaza to get aid in as securely and quickly as possible. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, let us all be in no doubt. Aid is required in Gaza, and it is required because when people are not being bombed, they are starving to death. The solution to that is a ceasefire and the opening of safe ground air routes, not the involvement on the ground of UK military personnel. These are dramatic and potentially dangerous developments. So will the Prime Minister confirm to the House today that before he makes a decision, all members will be afforded a vote? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am not going to apologise for our armed forces playing a leading role in supporting international efforts to get more aid in. And indeed, we are sending Royal Navy support ship RFA Cardigan Bay to the region to support that effort. But when he talks about this conflict, the fastest way to end this conflict is to ensure that we have a hostage deal that gets hostages out, aid in, and for there to be a sustainable pause in the fighting. And it seems clear that there now is a workable offer on the table. So I hope he joins with me in encouraging all parties, including Hamas, to accept that deal so we can move towards a sustainable solution. Mr Bill Wigan. My right honourable friend's decision to cancel HS2 led to £207 million for Herefordshire's potholes and transport infrastructure. Hereford Hospital has a new ward, new wards, more beds and a new diagnostic centre on the way. £35 million has been allocated to the River Y recovery plan. Inflation is down, the Rwanda bill has been passed, and defence spending is increasing. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that if he carries on like this, he's going to win the next election? Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm thankful for my honourable friend in highlighting the work that the government is doing, whether that is increasing. Uh, our defence spending to keep us safe, securing our borders with our Rwanda Act, cutting taxes by £900, raising the state pension by £900. I am also pleased that locally in Herefordshire we are filling in potholes, helping to save the River Wye and improving local health services. It shows crystal clear that it is the Conservative Government that has a plan and is delivering a brighter future for our country. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In February, his Foreign Secretary said it would be difficult for gro a ground offensive on Rafa to avoid harming civilians and destroying homes. Just yesterday, his Deputy Foreign Secretary admitted he was struggling to see how such an attack could be compliant with international humanitarian law. All the signs are that Netanyahu is about to defy the international community. An attack on the 1.5 million Palestinians sheltering in Rafa is imminent. If that attack begins, will that be the moment when the Prime Minister finally finds the moral backbone to ban arms exports to Israel? And if not, how much more suffering has to happen before he acts to prevent further UK complicity in crimes against humanity? Well, Mr Speaker, it, what the Honourable Lady did not acknowledge at all is that Israel suffered an appalling terrorist attack that kills hundreds of its citizens, and it does have the right to defend itself. Now, of course, as I have been crystal clear, we want to see humanitarian law respected and adhered to by all parties. Too many civilians have been killed, and we do want to see Israel take greater care to avoid harming civilians. I have made these points repeatedly to Prime Minister Netanyahu, specifically about the impacts of any military incursion into Rafa, and we continue to say to the Israelis at all levels that we want to see more aid going in and bring about a hostage deal so we can move towards a sustainable ceasefire. Andrew Slough. The 60 per cent increase in funding for special educational needs and disabilities is extremely welcome, but the challenges around the recruitment of community paediatricians mean that some children in Leighton Buzzard, Dunstable and Houghton Regis are waiting too long for an assessment. 
What can the NHS do to attract more of the 39,000 additional doctors recruited under this government into community paediatrics as a specialty, which is incredibly rewarding and important? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my honourable friend is right, and I know he joins me in welcoming the significant action that we've taken already to improve children's health, whether that's reducing sugar in children's foods, but the £600 million we've also invested to improve the quality of sport and physical activity in schools. Uh, the NHS has established a special group to ensure that the recovery of paediatric services keeps pace with that of adult elective care too, and I know that he will be pleased that the NHS long-term workforce plan that we have fully backed doubles the number of medical school places in England, increases specialty training places, and that will increase the size of the pool from which community, community paediatricians can be drawn in the future. Well, Mr Carmichael. Thank you. I know that you, Mr Speaker, want to join me in sending condolences to the friends, family and colleagues of our former colleague, Lord Andrew Stunnell, who served with exceptional diligence and grace as MP for Hazel Grove in this House and who passed away very suddenly on Monday. <laughs> Mr Speaker, when the BBC ends long-wave radio transmission next year, they will also end access to electricity tariffs like total heating with total control relied on by almost one million households across the United Kingdom. Switching to smart meters is not going to fix this for most people, not least because the rollout programme is so far behind. So will the Prime Minister or possibly his Secretary of State for Energy get the energy companies, the regulator and the customer groups together so that we can stop passing the blame around and find a solution that does not yet again leave people in the highlands and islands behind <laughs> and out in the cold? Um, well, Mr Speaker, I understand that an agreement has now been reached to ensure that radio teleswitching services will continue until June of next year, and Ofgem are also engaging with energy suppliers on their plans to support consumers through the transition. Whilst households that are currently covered by the service should not be disadvantaged by the switch-off, it is energy suppliers who are best placed to advise on tariffs for those who have been switched to a smart meter. However, I will make sure that the Right Honourable Gentleman does get a meeting with the relevant Minister to ensure that his constituents are not left behind during the transition. Peter Aldous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The East of England is playing a lead role in delivering the UK's energy security, and without our contribution, the country will not be able to successfully transition to a renewable energy supply system. In recent months, our coast has taken a battering, and projects like the Lowestoft Flood Defence Scheme have been postponed. Will my right hon. Friend ensure that government departments are fully coordinated so as to provide the region with good supporting infrastructure, proper protection for coastal communities and every opportunity for local people to take up exciting new jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we are levelling up across the United Kingdom and investing in places that need it most, including, as my honourable friend rightly highlights, our coastal communities. Almost a billion pounds of levelling up funding has been allocated to the east of England, including £75 million for coastal places. I know that he welcomes the town deal for Lowestoft in particular, but I will ensure that my honourable friend gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss how we can further support his region, its role in our energy security, but particular in coastal communities. Dear Drew yeah. yeah. uh, Mr Speaker, the Greenpeace group Unearthed found 36 supposed grassroots <laughs> campaign groups which were actually administered by Conservative staff and activists ah. and oh. were forums for vile racism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobic attacks on Sadiq Khan. Yeah. Now, one hears of other such coordinated efforts around anti 20 mile per hour zones in Wales. Can the Prime Minister shed some light on these shady groups spreading abuse, their funding, their links to his party, and whether he is aware of similar operations uh, existing elsewhere in the UK? If he won't, will he at least commit today to investigate and take action to tackle the sources of this grubby gutter politics? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware about, about the topic that the Honourable Lady raises, but, I, but, but I'm not going to make any apology for Conservatives pointing out the record of whether it's the SNP in Scotland or the Labour government in Wales, because that's exactly what democratic process is about. She might not like it when we highlight their record, but we will keep doing so that we can deliver for people across the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome our government's commitments to boosting defence spending and supporting yeah. Ukraine, made possible by this Conservative Prime Minister's international leadership and sound management of the economy. Yeah. My constituents have been doing us proud supporting Ukraine, like the Pot Place Garden Centre delivering ambulances, medical equipment and supplies, and Steve Hodgson providing vital aid. Would the Prime Minister join me in paying tribute to my constituents and people up and down the land for their support for Ukraine and reaffirm that we will continue to stand with Ukraine for the sake of freedom, democracy and global security? Yeah. I join my honourable friend in thanking people up and down the country, including the fantastic work of his constituents in supporting the Ukrainian community in the face of Putin's illegal invasion. We remain steadfast in support of Ukraine, and in total, since the war began, we have pledged over £12 billion of aid to Ukraine. Last week, we announced an additional half a billion pounds of funding, which will be used to deliver uh, much-needed ammunition, air defence and engineering support and drones. But more importantly, and President Zelensky welcomed this, we are able to now say that we will continue with this level of support for as long as it takes because of the historic increase in our defence spending. And it's crystal clear that on this side of the House we can say that our support to Ukraine will never waver. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 1969, my constituent Georgina Jacobs gave birth to a baby boy who she named Robert. Sadly, Robert was born asleep, and in those days the hospitals would ask the father to collect the baby's body, take it to the cemetery and leave it there for burial. For 53 years, Georgina didn't know exactly where Robert was buried. When she eventually found him, she shared her story on social media and other mothers who'd been through the same experience got in touch. Since then, Georgina has located over 60 babies on behalf of grieving parents and has deservedly been presented with the Wirral Award for her achievements. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Georgina on her award and on having brought comfort to so many parents and families? And will he, on behalf of all previous governments, apologise for this former practice with left grieving parents with nowhere to visit their buried children? Well, can I thank and commend the Honourable Lady for raising this case and just pay tribute to Georgina for what she is doing. I often say that one of the most incredible things about doing this job is meeting people like Georgina who have suffered tragedy in their lives but then use that to campaign and inspire and bring about a better life for everyone else. She's a prime example of that. She deserves nothing but our praise and admiration and I'm so pleased that she's brought comfort to so many other people too. Palsy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, since I was elected in 2010, Rugby has seen employment grow by nearly 6,000, with 10% more of my constituents in work, much of which has been driven by investment from advanced manufacturing in places such as Anstey Park, where we've got the Manufacturing Technology Centre, which the Prime Minister visited, High Temperature Research Centre, Rolls-Royce, Parker Meggett, Fanuc and the London Electric Vehicle Company. Given that every Labour government has left office with unemployment higher than when they came in, can the Prime Minister see any reason why anybody would want to put this fantastic progress at risk? My, uh, I, I was pleased to see for myself on a recent visit that my honourable friend is a great champion for his constituents in rugby, and I was very pleased to see the thriving local technology and manufacturing industry, which will help us deliver on our ambitions to make the UK a science and technology superpower. And he's right that we do have a record with one million fewer workless households, unemployment near record lows. And he's also right that we need to stick to that plan because that's how we'll deliver the long term change that our country needs and deliver a brighter future for families up and down the country, including in his constituency. Colin Lockhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hypocrisy needs called out, and everyone in this House will recall the former Irish Prime Minister in Brussels with a photograph of a bombed customs post lamenting that any border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland was unworkable, it was in breach of the Belfast Agreement, and could result in such troubles again. The hypocrisy of the Irish Government from such a position has not been lost, with the Irish police now tasked to patrol 
control the border, protect from the unsubstantiated, unfounded 80 per cent figure of asylum seekers who supposedly make their way to the Republic of Ireland from the UK via Northern Ireland, when actually the reverse is true. Will the Prime Minister challenge and call out these actions and confirm what representations he has made to the Irish Prime Minister and the Justice Minister to respect the integrity of our border? Well, the House will be aware that we have made commitments to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. And the Honourable Lady makes a very important point that the Irish Government must uphold its promises too. We can't have cherry picking of important international agreements. Uh, and so the, Secretary of State, so the Secretary of State is seeking urgent clarification that there will be no disruption or police checkpoints at or near the border. And I can confirm that the United Kingdom has no legal obligation to accept returns of illegal migrants from Ireland. Now, it's no surprise that our robust approach to illegal migration is providing a deterrent, but the answer is not sending police to villages in Donegal. It's to work with us in partnership to strengthen our external borders all around the common travel area that we share. Sir Desmond Swain. Mr Speaker, I was the Lord Commissioner that signed the Right Honourable Gentleman's <laughs> special pension into law. He, he owes me one! But the Prime Minister is right! Labour's 75 pence was an insult to pensioners. Yet last year, our triple lock afforded pensioners the highest increase in 30 years. The Prime Minister is going to continue to deliver for dignity in retirement, isn't he? <laughs> well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right that we will provide dignity to all those in retirement. That's why we introduced the triple lock, and that's why this year the state pension is rising by £900. I'm also proud of our record to bring 200,000 pensioners out of poverty, and I can also say, as I've said previously, that the state pension will increase in each and every year of the next Parliament. And as he reminds us about the 75p increase, unlike Labour, pensioners in this country can trust the Conservatives. Mr. Speaker, in only one of the 194 local authority areas in England are NHS ambulances meeting the national response time targets for responding to potential heart and stroke victims. Does the Prime Minister know which one it is? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when it comes to ambulance waiting times in A&E, of course there's more work to do. But the place where they are the worst in the country is in Labour on Wales. Mr. Speaker, thanks to our plan, we've seen an improvement in A&E and ambulance times. This winter over last winter, we have 800 more ambulances on the road, faster discharge out of our emergency care centres, and 10,000 virtual war beds. Now, virtual ward beds. Of course, as I said, there is more to do, but the contrast to Labour on Wales is crystal clear. It's the worst A&E performance anywhere in Great Britain. Mr. Speaker, for six months, thousands of my constituents have lived with foul polluted air from the Withyhedge landfill site. The company is owned by somebody with previous convictions for environmental crimes and who a few months ago gave £200,000 to help Vaughan Gething become First Minister of Wales after another of his other companies was loaned £400,000 from the Development Bank of Wales, overseen by the then Economy Minister Vaughan Gething. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this serious matter demands an independent investigation? It is not some internal Labour Party matter, and ultimately that company needs to get out of my constituency and let people in Pembrokeshire have their quality of life back. Well, my uh, my honourable friend brings up an incredibly important issue, and I know that people in Wales are concerned about the relationship that he mentions. And I also agree with him on the need for transparency and an investigation regarding the Welsh Labour leader, because it's very clear that the situation is, is the situation is not at all transparent and answers are needed. Yeah. 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 Speaker. Mr Speaker, it's been revealed by the Observer newspaper that the Conservative candidate for the Mayor of London is actually a member of the six Facebook groups which was mentioned by the member for Edinburgh North. And they are full of Islamophobia, anti-Semitism and the most disgraceful incitement to damaging property and the worst bit, 
for those of us who were in the House when our members of Parliament were taken, death threats to the current Mayor of London, Mr Khan. Will he close down these Facebooks, which have been begun by Conservative members of staff, begun by Conservative members of staff, and will he investigate the role of the current candidate and her membership of those disgraceful, racist Facebooks? Well, Mr Speaker, the election tomorrow will be fought on the substance of the issues that Londoners face, and the Labour record is crystal clear. House building in London has collapsed. Knife crime is rising. Mayoral taxes are up 70 per cent, and drivers have been hit with ULES charges. And the Labour mayor just simply panders to unions and has decimated London's nighttime economy. That's his record. That's how he'll be judged. And conserve people across London know that they will be safer with the Conservatives with lower taxes and better services. Final question, Karen Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, Mr. Speaker, is Staffordshire Day, where we celebrate all the brilliant things about the county of Staffordshire. So, would my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to our brilliant Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner, Ben Adams, and encourage the people of Staffordshire to vote for Ben tomorrow to make sure we keep Staffordshire one of the safest places to live, work, and visit? Yeah. Well, I, I wish everyone a happy Staffordshire Day. And, and she mentions the PCC elections, and I think it's right that she does because. Under this Conservative and previous governments, we've cut crime by over 50 per cent, delivered 20,000 more police officers, but people with a Labour Policing Crime Commissioner are more likely to be victims of burglary, twice as likely to be victims of robbery, and as I said, last year knife crime in London went up by 20 per cent. The facts simply speak for themselves. Vote Conservative for safer streets. Yeah. That completes Prime Minister's questions. We'll let the front benches clear.